Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Mom Mother's Day, Mom. Give them my hand. Mother's Day. Great day. An awesome day. Father's Day is next month, but this month is Mother's Day. We're going to honor the moms and make sure that you grab a rose uh, for your mother or in memory of your mother. Just something to remember them today. Moms are awesome. Um, I've been doing a, a series on, rela on our relationship with God and what God tries to do in our lives. Before I start, I just want to welcome Gavin Jones back. He had surgery. Uh, he was down and out for a little while. But uh, some amazing disciples in the city of Camarillo brought him dinners and went to Shelly and fed the family. I brought them the most delicious KFC yesterday. Uh, the colonel was there. Although he makes food like a general, they were willing to eat the colonel's food. So it was nice of them to allow that to be, be, be eaten. So it was awesome. You know, God is always working on our relationship with us, as I know that you're working on your relationship with God. And we're trying to really emphasize that we can follow God as disciples of Jesus, but yet not turn ourselves into a religion. We want to have a relationship. We want a relationship with God that is awesome. It's also scary. It's also unknown. It's also a mystery. But we also want a great relationship with each other as we live our lives with each other. We don't want to be a church where we only see each other on Sundays. That's religion. We want to be a church where we, we know each other during the week. And that's what inspires people when they come to visit our church. They notice that we actually know each other and like each other at some level. They, we, we enjoy our company. We like being around each other, right? We enjoy each other's company. So this is what the series is about, is really emphasizing our relationship with God and our relationships with each other. Last week, we talked about how God takes us to these walls where we feel like God has disappeared. Where is he? We feel desperate. We feel hopeless. And to not understand what God is doing, people can give up and walk away from God. And they've done it. They've left God because their trial, their crisis is so heart-wrenching that they think that God has literally abandoned them. Instead of God transforming them and they leave. Think about Abraham. When God told him you would have a, a child with Sarah, but he waited 25 years at the wall. Doubting, not sure. Think about Moses. He kills a man trying to help his people escape Egypt. And he ends up being a fugitive. And he's at the wall for 40 years in the desert in the land of Midian being a shepherd. Think about Elijah on Mount Carmel. He defeats all the prophets of Baal. And then he runs away to the furthest cave in the area because he's scared for his life. Think of Nehemiah. He was so discouraged to hear about Jeremiah, I mean, about Jerusalem being destroyed. Think about Jeremiah, who was commissioned to, to be the prophet for God's people. And no one changed. No one turned around. Or Paul, who had a messenger of Satan tormenting him day and night. And he asked God to be, to be removed. And God goes, no, you need that wall right now. You need it. And a lack of understanding of that wall is a major reason why people start out well being disciples. But they do not finish. The race of being a disciple. Look at me in James chapter 1. I read this last week. I'm just doing a little bit of a review of last week. For those who are, are new today. And it's, if you're visiting with us, it's great to have you here. It's awesome. I do want to welcome uh, from, from, from Santa Barbara. She's coming into Shoreline. And that is Jordan Snow back there. She's coming into Shoreline. Exciting to have her back. She went off to college. She is a biology major. She's getting her degree there. And uh, she'll return uh, to, admit to our ministry. So you'll be seeing her a lot more of her. And James 1 verse 2. And I'm sure, I'm sure that most of us have gone through this. But look at, look, look, look at the reasons why the, the writer is saying, look, if you're going through a challenge, 
If you're going through a crisis, God is doing something in your life. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Sounds like you're transformed, not lacking anything. God wants to give you something. But the question is, how long is this going to last, Gio? How long will I be at the wall? Well, it could be months. It's probably going to be longer. But ultimately, it's God who chooses the length of time. And it's God who chooses the intensity. Because God has a unique purpose for every one of us. to Knowing how much to cleanse out. How much to prune out of our, our, our inmost being. And he wants to infuse himself in us for a greater, longer-term purpose. God knows how much we can handle. Well, what's important to know is that the trials that we encounter are not the wall or the dark soul of the night, or the dark night of the soul, rather. Sometimes our trials daily are like traffic jams. That's not the dark night of the soul. I know we like to think it, but it's really not. Sometimes it's people parking in front of your house. That's not a dark night of the soul. That's annoying, right? <laughs> annoying bosses, delayed air flights, car breakdowns, fevers, dogs barking in the middle of the night. Those aren't the dark nights of the soul. Those are just little trials, you know? You got to overcome those. Walls are like David fleeing a jealous king for 13 years. Walls are like Job who, lo who lost his 10 children, his health, and all his possessions in one day. Those are the walls. The walls when you realize your marriage is crumbling. It's no longer working. Those are the walls. So what does it look like? Or what does it feel like to get through the wall? Like, what's life going to be like after this wall? Because it's God who takes us to the wall. What's it going to look like afterwards? Well, you may have known people. And I know you do. And I have known people. They, they've hit some pretty formidable walls, and yet the walls have not changed them. They've hit walls, and the, they just, like, bounce off the wall. And they return to the wall again, and they bounce off more bitter and more angry than before. Because the walls never change them. It's God who brings us through the wall. And that's an important thing to know. And with that comes mystery. How and when God takes us through the wall is up to him. We make choices every day to trust God, wait on God, obey God, stick with God, remain faithful when everything inside of us wants to quit when we're at the wall. But it's his slow, deep work of transformation in us that is happening. There's something happening and we want God to hurry up but God goes no these things are going to take some time this is when you know you're through the wall and you're going to hit these walls throughout your your, your your life as a disciple but this is how you know you're through one of the walls of many that are going to come number one you have a greater level of brokenness you know disciples Christians can be notoriously judgmental in the name of standing up for the truth. But people who've been through the wall are broken in a good way. They have seen the arrogance in which a man wants to be his own neighbor's judge. You see, before you go through the wall, we prefer to exercise the right to determine what's good and what's evil rather than leave this knowledge to God. After the wall, we know better. You know, I remember when I was a young parent, I read the books. I knew everything because I read the books. Yeah, yeah. I did what the books said. 
and I matched them with the Bible. And when I saw parents who weren't reading the book, hmm, that's why you're having trouble over there. <laughs> and I would stand in judgment in my heart going, you should read the book. You should educate. And all my parenting things, everything I did, everything, right, you can stand on this pedestal that I'm looking at others. Why aren't they doing this? But in the end, as every parent knows, there's no equations to our children getting the faith. There is no A plus B equals C. There is like a calculus equation, I think. That makes no sense to me. Because it's God who does it. It's God who's doing something. And parenting is a good example. Because you can live with regret as a parent. We're always living with regret. I could have said this. I should have done that. I should have had that extra talk, that extra quiet time. No, 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 no. But when you go through the wall, there's a higher level of brokenness. Some of the very first words uttered in the New Testament are in Matthew chapter 5. Turn there with me. Matthew chapter 5. Some of the very first words uttered. Religion stands in judgment of others. The religion does that because it's the religious people that stood in judgment of Jesus. It's religion that killed Jesus. Because they hadn't gone through the wall. They didn't see what God was doing. And they just stood as a religious institution and they killed Jesus. So here's some of the first words uttered in the New Testament. For someone who's gone through the wall has a greater level of brokenness. Look how it's described in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This describes a beggar who has hit rock bottom, having been stripped of everything. But Jesus is not describing someone who's destitute materially. He's describing someone who's destitute of elevating themselves above others. That's poor in spirit. I'm not better than you. Religion elevates themselves. People on the other side of the wall are freed from judging others. Pride in our tendency to judge others is found in every corner of the world. Every culture every workplace, every playground, every family, every neighborhood, every sports team, every marriage, every homeless shelter, every corporate board, there's judgment. And once you become a disciple, this, this automatically does not go away. It's because you're baptized, doesn't, doesn't go, it doesn't go automatic. You have to really be aware of this. And God will take you through the wall so you can really be poor in spirits it just has a new face once you're a disciple you can find yourself saying phrases like these these aren't direct quotes of me but some of them are i can't believe she calls herself a christian i don't know if you uttered those words but i know i have big churches are superficial i probably said that a couple times oh their church is small and dead oh look at what he's doing He's clearly not a disciple. I don't know if you've done that, but I've done some of those, maybe all of them. Another way of measuring your level of brokenness is to consider how offendable you are. Imagine an inflated person. When criticized, insulted, or judged, they pull back or they react. Contrast that person who is so secure in God's love that they're unable to be insulted when criticized or judged or insulted because that person thinks to himself, it's actually worse. <laughs> Thanks, but it's actually worse than that. That's someone who's been through the wall. St. Francis of Assisi says this, blessed is he who expects who expects nothing, for he shall enjoy everything. Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall enjoy everything. 
Let me give you an example of, of, of brokenness. Look in Luke chapter 18. Jesus gives us a story of what brokenness looks like, of what someone through the, who's been through the wall looks like. I love when I, I come across authentic, humble God lovers. It's just amazing. You can see it right away. Like this person has no God. This is who they are. This is, they're broken. They've been through the wall. They're like, hey, this is who I am. I love God, but I messed up. You know, I'm a messed up person and I love God. Like you, you, when you run into him, you're like, wow, I wish I was like that sometimes. But God will take us through the wall to get us there. So that's, that's why you have to appreciate the wall. And Luke 18. Jesus gives us a story and he's contrasting someone who's been through the wall and someone who hasn't. To, in verse nine, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. They'll go through the wall. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Religion versus relationship. It's clear as day. Jesus takes relationships every time. That's what he wants. He wants a relationship with you. And I, I would suggest to you that you consider in your, in your time with God to lock into that phrase that says, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. I don't think I say that enough to God. Because that's the level of brokenness that I want to walk with every day. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I don't want to end up like the Pharisee. I want to be connected to God. The second thing about people that go through the wall, not only do they have a good level of brokenness, but they have a greater appreciation for God's mystery. They don't think they know everything about God. I don't know about you, but I like control. I like to know where God is going, exactly what he's doing. I want to know the exact route of how we're going to get there, God, and exactly when we're going to arrive. I like to remind God of his need to behave in ways that fit my clear understanding of him. Don't confuse me, God. I know that God's merciful. I know he's good. I know he's wise. But I also know that he's utterly incomprehensible. He's beyond my grasp of every concept that I have of him. In Job chapter 9, verse 10, it says this about God. And this is God, you know, he who performs wonders cannot be fathomed. Miracles that cannot be counted. God is not an object that I can determine, master, possess, or command. But unconsciously, I think we make a deal with God that goes something like this. If I obey and keep my part of the bargain, now you bless me. And when that gets messed up, we don't do well. Hey, I'm obeying. So God, don't allow any serious suffering. Because I'm obeying. And there's kind of like we make this unconscious agreement in our mind with God. Hey, I'm obeying. Good things should happen. Job 11, verse 7 says this. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Nope. Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? Nope. There's an old story in China, a very old story. You've probably heard of this, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. There's a wise father and a son. 
the son has a horse. And the horse runs away and the village comes up to this father and the son. Oh, it's so terrible. What a disaster. You lost your own transportation, the horse. And the dad says, what makes you so sure it's not a blessing? A few months later, the horse comes back with the stallion. Oh, my gosh. You're so blessed. What amazing. It's the best horse ever. And the father says, what makes you so sure it's not a disaster? A few months later, the son is riding the stallion and falls and breaks his hip. Oh, the village comes. Oh, oh sir, this is terrible. Your son, he broke his hip. The father says, what makes you so sure it's not a blessing? A few months later, nomads invade the country and they get every able body male to fight in the war. Nine out of the 10 males in that town died, except for the son who didn't go because he was lame with the broken What appeared to be a blessing and a success turned out to be a terrible thing. What appeared to be a terrible event turned out to be a rich blessing. God is mysterious. And I have to appreciate that. There's something about God that's just mysterious. That I don't know everything that's going on. In Ecclesiastes 3, it says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. You know, one of the greatest fruits from going through the wall is having a childlike, deepened love for mystery. You know, we tell our kids all kinds of mysterious stories. Yeah. The kids are like, ah, oh, this is great. That's what the wall produces. Like, God, you're a mystery. You're amazing. And because I know that, I can rest easily and live more freely on the other side of the wall, knowing that God is in control and worthy of my trust. I can trust God. I won't get too excited over a blessing and I won't get too down over a disaster. Who knows what it's going to become? Who knows what God's going to do with that? That's what I love about God. In Psalm 56, it reads, when I am afraid, when I'm at the wall, when I'm scared, I put my trust in you. Are you at the wall? Are you going through the wall? Are you at the wall and you're tempted to turn away and quit? I urge you not to, but let God transform you through the walls, through the trials, through the difficulties, through the crisis. Psalm 84 reads, Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. When we're at the wall, like Abraham was, when we can't see God, God wants to pull you through to give you one, a higher level of brokenness, and two, to appreciate the unknown about God, to appreciate what we don't know about God. And as we think about our day, think about your mother. Just think about her. She may not be with us on this earth anymore, but think about your mom today. If your mom is present, encourage your mom. If your mom is physically near you, go see your mom. Go encourage your mom. I had lunch with my mom this week. It was awesome. She made me the classic Nicaraguan lunch. <laughs> classic. It's called gallo pinto with a, piece of, with a piece of meat that has breadcrumbs on it fried and a cup of coffee at lunch. As Ecuadorians are introduced to coffee at age eight because it's sugary. So guess what? I love sugary coffee. If I have black coffee, I'm like, that is not coffee, right? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Encourage your mom. I wrote a card, a card for my mom. And I wrote a long card. I usually say, Happy Mother's Day, Mom, I love you. But this time I wrote something out. You're, I, I just felt like encouraging. And Karen, I said, Karen, Karen, what do you think? She's like, wow, you wrote that? I'm like, I wrote that. I wrote that. <laughs> It was awesome. So we're going to pray for our mothers. We're going to ask the, the we're going to have a, then we'll have a prayer, take our communion, and then we'll have another prayer for our contribution. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for bringing us to the wall and, and, and carrying us through the wall and pushing us through the wall so we can come out more poor in spirit, more appreciating your mysteries. 
more being more trusting of you and what you're doing in our life. God, help us to focus on relationship and do away with religion. Jesus was relationship. Help us to see you more clearly, but appreciate the unknown, but also appreciate the level of brokenness that we have, that we don't look down on others, God. We want to we want to be there for others. We want a relationship with others that are impactful. And God, that you would bless all the moms today, bless all the memories of the moms today. And we thank you for giving us fathers. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.